بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وبعد الحمد لله this is the third session now after we had this the great in, <coughs> in depth in depth fiqh aspect of marriage and divorce from Mufti Abdul Rahman and after me inshallah we'll have the final session given by Sheikh Hassan Ali but i think this particular session is probably you know the most intriguing or probably the most interesting not because i am talking definitely not the case but it's because of the topic um, <clears throat> normally, you know, this topic is normally not discussed. I mean, f- from my knowledge, this is the first time ever, I think, in a masjid, where we have all the brothers, in a masjid, openly this topic being discussed. When Shaykh Abdul Rahman called me, and he said we have an idea of having a session dealing with just intimate aspects of marriage between husband and wife. I said to him, are you sure? You know, in the masjid? Because I had an experience last year. I mean, I don't know if you know this book which I authored recently and it was released, Islamic Guide to Sexual Relations. <clears throat> Before this book was released, somebody, one of the institutes in another city, I won't tell you which city and which institute, it's an academy institute. They have shuyukh and ulama, famous scholars. They want you to do a one-day course on sexual intimacy, Islamic Guide to Sexual Relations, in another city, in, in the UK. And I also, I said to him, look, you're inviting me, and I don't know how it is, but you know best. So I said, okay, if you think it's okay, and this was not in the masjid, and it was only for brothers. But after having arranged it, and I'll, mention, I'll tell you why I'm mentioning this, after have, having arranged it, there was a lot of, you know, this and that in the society, the whole thing was a taboo. To the point that in my city where I come from, people started questioning why you would need a whole day seminar course on what they said, sex. And then, I was actually at that time in the process of writing this book, and that actually made me more even eager to write about this topic. And then, I wrote an introduction, and the introduction that I've written in this book is actually based on all those negative comments. It's a very strong introduction. Why not just it is maybe, uh, you know, it's just maybe permissible or recommended? I think discussing these issues is probably obligatory in our times. Farad, talking about these issues. Because, and you can ask the scholars, Mufti Abdul Rahman, Sheikh Hassan Ali, and the rest. The scholars, imams of the masjid and the shuyukh and the ulama, they get approached by the public, general public, with their personal questions. And many times, because, and, and sometimes when, the, you see, especially when we, we had this whole phenomenon of, of the internet come up, before people could ask questions to the shaykh or the alim or the mufti, it's one on one. So you're uh, um, slightly fearful or embarrassed or ashamed of asking certain, scholar, uh, certain questions. But on the internet, everyone's anonymous. You go on the forum and there's Abdullah who's probably Khadija. <laughs> That's what happens in all these forums. There's all these people, a male, a female, female, male, and you don't know who's asking you what question. So because of that, people started asking questions with a lot of courage. And me, like many other people, we face a lot of questions. And I started receiving a lot of different types of emails about this specific issue of the husband and wife intimate relationship. And what I started doing was kept, I started, you know, uh, <clears throat> I kept a record of the type of questions that were being asked. I used to have a small notebook, just make a note. I've answered this question, I've done a bit of research, this is the question, this question, sometimes just on the phone, so... I used to just make a note. 
suddenly I had a whole list of issues that people have asked about in terms of just basic sexual relations between husband and wife. And that actually, the note, you know, the page or the notebook that I had with all the notes that I used as a basis and foundation to write this book. Now, so I was saying it's probably further in our times to talk about these issues. And not just in our times, in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this topic was openly discussed. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I mean, th- this is the first thing that this, you know, th- th- there's, you know, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, despite being the most purest, we were talking about pure hearts earlier on, the most purest of individuals and human beings, yet, not just did he, you know, uh, mentioned these aspects of husband-wife intimacy, he went into the details of the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. And the reason is simple. The suburb, the reason behind it is simple. What's the reason? Because as I say, the couple happy in bed, happy in marriage. If you want a prosperous marriage, you have to be happy in a physical sense. There are a lot of dead marriages out there. And I'm talking about dead marriages, where the, the couple are unhappy in the whole relationship of marriage because there are problems within the bedroom department. Everything triggers off from there. Not all the time, but many times things trigger off from there. When they are not happy in their physical relationship, they are unhappy in other parts of the relationship. When they are unhappy in the other parts of the relationships, unfortunately marriages come to an end. So this could be a cause of marriages. Without a doubt, marriages come to an end. The man looks elsewhere because he's not being fulfilled or because of certain other things. So, many problems come about because of issues connected to sexual relations. I mean, this is a topic, you know, this first time I'm talking about it in open in public and it's not easy to talk about it. It's difficult. Even to write about this was, was very, very difficult. But when you're writing, you know, you can just write away, nobody's looking at you, but here is like everybody looking at me and I have to talk about these issues. But um, if the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now I'm just going to discuss one or two issues based on this book. I mean that's you know what I have in here, <clears throat> and I have some you know as- aspects here or certain titles here or points that we need to uh, cover. So first thing, which is in the introduction of this book, is that when it comes to matters of deen, there should be no shyness. Uh, as I said, that we had to cancel that program in the other city. When it comes to aspects about deen, we shouldn't have shyness. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be too modest. You know, one of the spiritual diseases, actually talked about in one of some of the books, is to be over modest to the point that you neglect aspects of deen. You know, somebody is extremely shy. Because he's shy, he doesn't want to offer his salah. You know, he's shy. People think I'm this. That being over modest, it's a spiritual disease. Sometimes, you know, people try to be you know, try to be modest and they overlooked or overlook or neglect aspects of deen. When it comes to religious matters and learning about deen, shyness should never prevent us from learning about the detailed aspects of deen. And there are, you know, Sayyidah Aisha Sadiqa radiallahu anha says, Imam al-Bukhari mentions this in his kitab al-ilm of his sahih, that she said, نِعْمَ النِّسَاءُ نِسَاءُ الْأَنصَارِ لَمْ يَكُنَ الْحَيَاءُ يَمْنَأُهُنَّ مِنْ أَنْ يَتَفَقَّهْنَ فِي الدِّينِ how admirable are the women of Ansar? How admirable are the women of Ansar? Haya and modesty did not prevent them from having a deep understanding. Then they were not shy when it came to learning about matters of deen. Rather, you should this modesty and haya that you have in your life should be used when learning. Should be used and implemented when learning about detailed aspects of deen. There's two types of people don't learn. Imam al-Bukhari then same in the same chapter in Kitab al-Ilm. He said, وَقَالَ مُجَاهِدْ لَا يَتَعَلَّمُ الْعِلْمَ مُسْتَحْيٍ وَلَا مُسْتَكْبِرٌ Two types of people do not seek knowledge. One is a proud, arrogant person. And this happens a lot of the times. Sometimes out of pride and arrogance we don't learn. You know, there's, in the masjid there's a dars going on after Maghrib Salah of the Qur'an. The Imam is young, I am in my 60s, how can I sit in his dars and learn? Out of pride and arrogance. That man will not learn about deen because he's arrogant. Okay, you learn, even if he's younger than you. So, pr- 
pride stops people from learning. Number one. And number two, مستقبر ولا مستحيل A shy person. How can I talk about this? How can I ask about this question? You're just shy about issues. So, shyness and, uh, and pride, these are two things that prevent. So the, f- the point here is that we, you know, we, we, should, we shouldn't be shy to learn about these things. And especially this aspect, as we say, Islam is a comprehensive religion. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa talked about basic issues. You know, there's a hadith here where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, he even talked about aspects like how, when you go to the washroom, to the toilet, how to relieve yourself, clean yourself. This is just in Islam. You will not find this anywhere else. And actually, the compan- well, some of the mushrikun, they mocked the sahaba companion, Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu, this is a hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood, where they said, you know, they came to him and said, your Prophet teaches you everything. Hatta al khiraa لَقَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَ Even about etiquette of going to the toilets and washing yourself and cleaning yourself. He said, of course, this is our Prophet. Ajal, why not? So we're proud of this fact. And about sexual matters, there are hadiths as clear as anything. This is the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, if an imam said some of the things that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam said, some people in the community would feel offended. Seriously, some people in the community would feel offended. So it's all cultural. There are certain aspects, if you look in, into the lives of the Sahaba, some things you can, you know, I actually, there's one thing, I'm not going to talk about it because there's no time, but there's one incident within the Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's about another topic. I mentioned it once in a talk, I started the talk, I said there was a man, I never mentioned who he was, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's another story. And I mentioned the whole thing, there's a man and this, some people are saying it was tough. And I said, you know who those people are? Who I'm talking about? That man was Abu Bakr. He went to Umar, and then he went to Uthman, and then he came to the Messenger of Allah. People were shocked. Just wanted to see. See, it's culture. A lot of the things, unfortunately, we have culture based in our Islam, the pure religion. He talked about, you know, basic, even women would come. I mean, now, I mean, of course, the Messenger of Allah was a pure individual. Therefore, we wouldn't recommend this. And, and there are definitely exceptions for the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like al khalwa al ajnabiya was permissible for him as well. But women used to come. There's a hadith here. Ummu Sulaim came to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah la yastahi min al haq Verily, Allah is not shy from the truth. And then she said, "Does a woman have to take an obligatory bath if she has ihtilam, if she, you know, um, has a wet dream?" And then the Messenger وسلم, replied, yes, if she notices the discharge, she has to as well. And then the hadith goes on. So this is the first point, that there's no shyness when it comes. You know, the Messenger وسلم, talked about it. So in the introduction, I've actually mentioned three, four points. That the, one reason was that, you know, because it's very important, marriages, in the, marriages are breaking down because of not knowing about the details of this topic. Uh, and uh, Islam doesn't neglect this. You look at the books, hadith, and then you look at, you know, Classical books of, Quran, uh, of, sun, uh, of fiqh, many detailed books, there are chapters dedicated to this topic in Arabic. I've given a list here, Imam al-Ghazali, Zahih al-Muddin, Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyan and Tibb al-Nabawi, Ibn al-Qudam al-Mughni, uh, Imam Abu al-Faraj, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, in his book Sayyid, Sayyid al-Khatir, many other scholars, chapters, 20, 30, 40 pages, look at Ihya al-Muddin, where he discusses this topic in detail, and they all talked about it, why? Because a healthy sexual relationship between a husband and a wife is absolutely vital in marriage. As I said, a couple happy in bed, happy in marriage. So this is the reason. And one of the reasons why we need to know this is that, is that um, some Muslims don't know the basics. Like once I came across one brother, he didn't know that sexual intercourse during menstruation is haram. He said, I've been doing it all my life. Basic stuff, absolutely categorically haram in Islam. Yet, these, uh, he, he was not aware of, of it. So that's another reason why we need to know. And sometimes, there's a fourth reason which I've discussed in the introduction. You can read all this anyway. But one is that sometimes some people, they, they think certain things are haram and sinful. And in reality, they are not. Okay, they are halal. There's not, no problem, you know, because... Uh, they're not committing a sin by doing it because they but the problem is that they think that it is haram now there's a, there's a very uh, you know a very um, subtle in, uh, 
aspect here which we should keep in mind, which is that if somebody is committing something or doing something, considering it to be unlawful, haram, even though in actual fact, in reality, it is halal, but if he is doing it or he, she is practicing or exercising it, thinking it to be haram, it's okay anyway, it's haram, but might as well just do it. Even though in reality it is halal, this will have a negative impact on the person. The person will become more lax about Islam as a whole. One haram today, another haram, I had committed that sin anyway, let me commit this sin as well. Do you understand? So this is why, if you need to know exactly, if this is halal, halal. And if you tell them this is halal, they would not go into haram. Or they would not do it out of, you know, thinking it, it's haram. And in this book, actually, I've tried my best to give as much flexibility as possible. I know everybody's going to be happy now. As much flexibility. If you don't give flexibility between husband and wife, where, you know, where else? I mean, this is a holy relationship. We live in a time when, you know, people are, you know, go just today, go outside. It's, it's difficult to walk outside for men on a sunny day. You know, like my father who says that I always make dua, there's no sun in England. <laughs> he always says, he makes dua. You know, it's like, it's punishment of Allah when the, there's hot weather. Because you just cannot, cannot go outside. It's difficult, keeping the gaze low. So, we live in a time where everywhere there's filth, there's nudity, there's, there's on the, you can't drive a car looking at billboards. You know, you just, you punch a, a, a traffic light, there's a massive billboard there with, you know, there's a car there, there's a woman there, and it says, test drive it, or something. Like a Hamidji that one said, whether the car or the woman. So, it's very difficult. Now, therefore, we need alternative, and Islam gives us the purest alternative, which is marriage. And why make things difficult in Islam? Why make things which are not halal? You know, in the Quran, there's, most of the places in the Quran is not, don't make... Don't make haram into halal. Majority of the Quran says, لِمَا تُحَرِّمُ مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ لَكَ Why are you making haram that which Allah has made halal for you? You see, pick up the Quran everywhere. Allah will say, don't make into haram what Allah has allowed you to do. So if this flexibility, you know, and if it's saving a marriage to the point that some of the scholars say and are of the opinion that if certain things are slightly disliked, makruh, tanzih, khilaf al-awla, to the point that sometimes even if it's more, but if it's saving a marriage, then you would actually do that because it's a khaf al less of the two evils. Because it's a very holy relationship in Islam, sacred relationship. Saving a marriage, many things are allowed in order to save a marriage. Many things become allowed, permitted. Not the absolute categorical haram. If there's a difference of opinion, it's another opinion of another scholar, of another madhab, you may take it. I'm not giving you a general ruling here, just giving you a kind of example. But you may take it, if it's not allowed according to the, for example, Hanafis, and it's allowed according to the Shafi'is, if it's saving your marriage, then go and ask a scholar. He, he may give you that permission that you can take from the Shafi'i madhab, or the Maliki, or the Hanbali. Because it's saving a marriage, because saving a marriage is very important. You have children involved. You know, you don't want children to live the life without parents, and, and you know, suffer all their lives. So, therefore, we've given as much as, you know, permission, inshallah. And now there's certain things here... Okay, just keep this inshallah. I'm just going to base it on this. These were some notes which some people made up based on this book anyway. Um, there's a chapter here, Intentions and Sexual Relations. Intentions of Sexual Relations. Uh, how much time do I have? Another 15 minutes? Okay. Um, intentions. Remember, having the correct intention of sexual relations. Very important, having the correct intention. Um, I'm not going to go into the much uh, details of this, but make sure anything in, this, anything in Islam we do, we, we do it with the right intention, we get rewarded. That's with everything, it's general. You go into business and trade and you intend that, look, I am earning money, wealth, acquiring wealth, so that I can feed my family, provide for my children, eat myself, get the energy, inshallah, it'll be rewarded. And that's why the Messenger وسلم, said, Atajir as-saduq al-ameen ma'an nabiyyina wa siddiqina wa shuhada'i wa salihin. So, therefore, Intention is generally important in, in, for a Muslim. Likewise, sexual relations. Have the right, correct intention. And I've mentioned intentions like, for example, one of the things is having children. Tazawaju al wadud al walud. Okay, one of, one of the objectives are not just sexual intercourse, but marriage itself is to have children. So that's one good intention. Another, another intention, for, you know, uh, Preventing oneself and saving oneself, safeguarding, protecting oneself from the haram and the unlawful, which is very important. 
And number three, very important, fulfilling the right of your spouse. Think about that as well. You have a spouse and you're fulfilling their rights. If you're a husband, say, look, Allah has given me this responsibility. Don't do it for your own self, that my, my pleasure, my, my, my. We live in a time where it's just my, me, 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 and my. Think about your wife. She has needs, look, I am fulfilling her right. Likewise, women have to think like that as well. And some other things as well. And I've actually mentioned that even enjoyment, intending enjoyment is also not haram. This is actually a very good point. You know, I said here, enjoying this great gift that the all merciful has given to mankind, even that's one of the objectives. Some people, you know, they have this whole concept about sexual intercourse. It's like a taboo thing, you know, I've talked about it. It's like a, something that you just do it out of need and, you know, it's like going to the washroom or something. You know, they say, like, jali jali karlo, bas khatam farih ho You know, in a reserved manner or thing. It's not like that in Islam. Wafi bud'i ahadikum sadaqa. One of you fulfilling your sexual relations with your spouse, the sadaqa. It's charity. This is charity. That doesn't mean that don't give any money, you know, that's it. Every time somebody comes with donation. <laughs> say, I'm going to go home and do some charity. <laughs> but it's different times. As I say, wajibul waqt. There are things for different occasions and times. But it's charity. So don't think it's some dirty, you know, it's not filthy. It's, it's a halal act. You do it in a halal way, you'll be rewarded inshallah. You know, so, and then we have rights. Sexual intercourse is the right of both spouses. This chapter 2 talks about that we, what I want to say just here, just a couple of minutes on this, is that we think, again, it's culture. We think that sexual intercourse is the right of the man. We forget women have rights as well. We as men, we, they'll be told that they need to, you know, make sure the hadith. But we, the only, you know, some husbands, the only hadith they remember are, you know, the angels curse the woman if they've, that's the only, and every time they, they threaten their women. Look, you, I'll bring the Sahih Bukhari, the angels curse you until morning and I'm, I'm going to be upset. Some go to the point that I'll divorce you and this, that's not the way. There are ways of, of course, you know, doing this. But remember, as husbands, even women have a sexual right. And the scholars go into extreme detail. How often do you have to, you know, as a right of sexual relations? You know, there's hadiths here, there's different opinions. Imam al-Ghazali said it is religiously obligatory fard for a man to have sex, sex with his wife once every four nights. If she wants to, that is. But it's her right. If she demands it and she wants, she requests, it's her right. Imam al-Ghazali said this. There are different opinions. The Hanafi school say... Every so often, there's no you know, fixed time period, frequently, every so often, in a way that you save her from committing a sin, any kind of sin. You satisfy her so that she's not inclined towards any unlawful haram act. Now there are so many men who do not fulfill their wife's uh, right. Seriously, I mean, I, I've spoken to so many, I don't know if Abdul Rahman will be as well. There's, there's, seriously, there are so many, there's, Many times, I've spoken to actually more women who say that their husbands don't have uh, sexual relations with them and do not fulfill their rights. More than talking to men where women are not ready to give their rights to them. We always talk about women, you know, women, the hadiths are there, strict, you know, la'na, la'na, curse. I've spoken to more women. Now do you think the man, is because, you know, the man doesn't have any urges? Of course he has. What is he doing? Ask him. Ask him what he's doing. He is fulfilling his desires, but where and how and, you know, ask him. He knows best. Now, unfortunately, you know, this, this is the time we're living in. And there are reasons why this happens anyway. Sometimes it's the wife's fault. You know, if the wife is disrespectful, disobedient, aggressive and uh, fouled mouth, then the man, of course, gets put off and, and, you know, the whole, there's no relationship and, and that's another topic. But, you know, um... It, they have a right. Don't just think they are just, it's only when we have a right, when we need to, you know, that's it, we'll fulfill their rights, and that's it, they're just there like a machine, and we can switch it on and off whenever we want. It's not like that. They are human beings, they're created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they have rights. So fulfill their rights. And then there's a topic here about how I'm not going to go into that. And then here, selecting a time. Select a, select a good time. There's a good time when you're not too hungry, not too... Uh, thirsty, not overfilled, and uh, not when you're angry or things like that, when you're calm and things like that, very important. And then I have a chapter here, preparing, that's actually very important, Pre preparing for sexual relations. This is extremely important, highly important. Preparation. 
Preparation means to, to, in order to maintain a healthy sexual relationship, vital to prepare psychologically and physically. Psychologically should be there, you know, with your words and, and you know how it should be prepared, that you should be nice and considerate. You know, the hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that, you know, a man, you know, how can you have a woman responding to your advances when all day long, you know, you beat her up and then in the middle of the night you become all, yeah, I love you and this and that. You know, so do you think she's, do you think she's just a machine, like an animal or something? This is the hadith. يأتي أحدكم جلد العبد أن فلأله يضاجعها من آخر يومها حديث الله مسجد صلى الله عليه وسلم. so psychologically but physically brothers there's no sense here brothers psychologically highly important I'm telling you this is I'm I'm telling you it's very important yeah sisters and women are highly sensitive creatures. Don't think, you know, that, oh, we can be dirty, filthy, you know, bad odor coming from your mouth. You just had a cigarette and you think you want to kiss her and things like that. And your dirty clothing, it doesn't work like that. She might not tell you anything. She might have sexual relations with you. It is slowly but gradually, slowly, gradually. It has an impact on her. Islam places a great deal of emphasis on tahara, nawafa. And there's a coach here, Abdullah ibn Abbas, I think, was, who said that just like I, just... The, the way I like my women to adorn for me, I want to adorn myself as well for my women. You need to be, you know, in a nice, uh, presentable, physical state. Otherwise, they'll get put off you. They're not just, you know, some animals that they just, whatever, you know, some people just come in a dirty, filthy clothing, bad smell coming out from their body, etc. No, you should be in a presentable state. Apply ithar, perfume. This preparation is probably extremely important. I've got it all here, read it, inshallah, if you can. I'm not selling my book, I just don't know, it's just, I, mean, I don't get anything anyway, so. Um, so, uh, this, this is preparing is very important. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's some, you know, he talked about this in great depth and detail. Um, as, you know, I can't emphasize this enough, I'm telling you, because it's very important. Don't even do things that will put your partner off in front of them. I know it's difficult. And it's difficult living at home and you know to be in a state all the time. You know, there's a I said one thing here is very beautiful, which I really loved and which I quoted. Imam Abu Faraj ibn al Jawzi, Rahimahullah, is a Hanbali scholar. I quoted him. He talks in his book Sayyid al Khatir. He says, um, the actual quote, I don't know where it is in this book somewhere, but uh, he says that uh, that لا يشتمعاني في حال الكمال. Husband and wife should never get together unless they are in a complete physical state of, you know, uh, in a state of, uh, you know, uh, cleanliness. And he says, according to me, he says, وَلْيَكُنْ لَهُ فراش وَلْيَكُنْ لَهَا فراش. That's his viewpoint, okay? We don't have to act upon it. According to him, he said, according to me, it's better that the husband has a separate bed to sleep the wife has separate, normally you don't, don't, you know. He says they should not meet too often, because you'll get bored of one, of one another. And you should not just completely depart from one another, because, you know, <laughs> he'll forget her. He says, frequently, every three, four days, when you're physically prepared, then have that union. Otherwise, try to sleep separately and have that gap. And it keeps the passion moving, moving. And I actually wrote an answer on this because somebody asked this question, is it okay for me and my wife to have this kind of arrangement where we live, you know, like you know, meet up here and there. And... But that's if you, if you have children, then what's going to happen? It's going to be difficult, you know? of course. But maybe in the house, if you're not in a physical state where you can see each other or sleep with one another, then okay, you know, you know sometimes if you don't want to, you don't have to. But that's his opinion. But I'm not endorsing it or anything like that. I'm just saying that's his opinion. But the point here is that you should only meet and have a uni- union when you are in an absolute, complete physical state. And then, so that, there's a lot of importance on yes. preparation, preparing. And then there's a section on foreplay. Foreplay is very important, especially for men. Okay? Men, they just think, you know, it's like, they say, I don't know if I can say this in the masjid, but they say, wam bam, thank you. you know, that's not, men, you know, that's not what Islam says. That's, that's non-Muslims. Muslims, Islam tell, says, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, not only he encouraged it, but he actively engaged in it himself. Um, there are so many hadiths here, and that's why the ulama say that it's mustahab recommended. Some say it's fard for a man to go uh, and have foreplay with his wife. 
uh, and then there are all the details of the foreplay. But remember, it's it's you know you have to you have foreplay. It's not just uh, women. As I said, it, with women you must you must have foreplay before. Otherwise, there's a hadith here. The sanad is not too strong. The chain of transmission which I quoted, Ganzul um, Ummal. I'm forgetting where is it. Um, where the best, um, he said that. Uh, um, okay, I can't remember. I can't remember the actual hadith. Uh, it was ab- about this, about foreplay. Anyway, which was that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam highly encouraged it. Uh, he, he he you know described the person who has sexual relations with his wife without foreplay in a very negative manner. So anyway, foreplay is very important. And then we have. Rules. Now rules, you know the basic rules, just, I'm just going to do another 2-3 more minutes inshallah, I'm going to end. Uh, privacy, very important rule, privacy in every way, shape or form. Yeah? Privacy from the eyes of people, privacy from the ears of people. Very important. People remember the privacy, you know, veiling yourself from the eyes of people, but people don't remember about the sound as well. If, if you think they're going to make too much sound, then don't go in a hotel or somewhere. Uh, and don't sleep next door to your parents. Um, privacy. Uh, so, uh, and with there's a, another rule about um, uh, du'a. Remember, there's du'as here. Remember, if you have certain books like Quran, things like that, cover them up. Recite the du'a, the hadith, which is. Uh, mentioned in Sahih Bukhari elsewhere where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if one of you wants to have sexual relations say Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannibna shaytan ma razaqtana read that uh, and um, in terms of the rules two things are absolutely forbidden two things two things are absolutely forbidden one is this is categorically totally qat'i nas absolute absolutely there's no two opinions about two things number one is Anal intercourse, which is completely haram, sinful, filthy, dirty, inhumane act. And it's unhealthy, and, and even the medical experts attest to this. The other is sexual intercourse during menstruation. That is also dirty, filthy, and you know, there's filth. You know, and the reason why, you know, when there's filth there, it's harmful medically. And the ulama say that when, uh, you know, where there's menstruation in the vaginal area, when there's temporary filth, Allah prohibits it, then in the anal intercourse, where there's permanent filth, in Bab in Awla, from a greater extent, it should be haram. That these two things are totally haram. And even medically, it's proven that they are harmful. Talk to the experts and they'll tell you. I have two doctors checking this book as well. And they agreed with most of the contents, 99% of it. If you want to two small things here and there, you could have different opinion. And uh, those two things are haram. Remember that. Menstrual period, as, and number two, anal intercourse. Other than that, other than that, in terms of husband-wife relationship, you could have a bit ifs and buts and however and this and that and, and just check it up with a scholar. I know one question which is in everybody's head. I'm not, there's no time for me to discuss that. Read it in the book. Uh, no, no. Sheikh Hassan Ali is going to talk now, inshallah. No, no. It's just this oral sex issue. I mean, I, I've, I've talked about it here. Look, um, the, the, the thing I've mentioned here about oral sex, and Allahu alam, is that if it involves any, um, it's going to be very brief because, and read it, and don't take this at face value because there's more details to this. If it involves any kind of uh, filth, getting into contact and touching the mouth, then it's absolutely haram. Filth meaning any kind of liquid discharge. Men have money, madhi, wadi. Madhi is the pre ejaculatory fu- fluid, money is the sperm. And wadi is a, dis- a fluid, a discharge, which normally, you know, it's, it's because of sometimes illness, it's quite common and regular uh, after you urinate sometimes. You know, so, but normally during sexual relations, you have money and, and madhi. I've defined both of them in this book. Uh, if that, if there's a fear of it or likelihood, then it's haram. Okay? Which is very difficult to avoid. So therefore, you wouldn't be allowed to continue many scholars. But if, in some way, shape, or form, that is avoided. Avoided. Maybe just some subtle, you know, kissing around the area or anything like that. Fine. That would maybe allowed. Maybe permissible. But disliked, nevertheless. You know, it's discouraged. Khilaf al awla So this is the khulasa which I gave here. Uh, and then, um, 
all the positions that I mentioned, I've mentioned a lot of positions here, Kulluhu halal, all the positions are halal, no problem, uh, it's not a problem. And remember, I also mentioned here that trying different positions and, and spicing up your sex life doesn't go against taqwa. You don't become a less muttaqi and you don't become an extra pious person just because you know, you're reserved about these matters. Rather, you are more pious if you are good about these matters with, with your wife. Okay? With your wife, of course. Um, so, you know, I don't, as I mentioned in the beginning, I don't know where this concept has come from that you, know, this, you become more pious because you're reserved about these matters. Islamically, that's not the case. Um, and then after sexual relations, there's a lot of things. Number one, being affectionate, especially with women. You know, if you finish your job and then that's it, you're not interested in it anymore, they think that you're only there for just one reason. That, that's what women genuinely think. So, Islam says that, you know, afterwards it's very important you be affectionate and you show that, look, you're not there only for one job. And in Asian community, you're only for two, three jobs, cooking, cleaning, and this. So, there are, you know, there's other reasons there as well. Cleanliness, purification, very important. Learn the rules, fiqh of tahara. You know, if money comes or money comes onto your clothing, you have to get it washed. Salah is invalid. Uh, invalid. Uh, it's impure according to all the schools of thought. Even the Shafi'i school of thought. Money, the sperm, and the pre ejaculation fluid. So make sure that you learn the rules of purification. And ba- uh, about ritual bath, learn the rules. There are a lot of rules here. It's very detailed. I don't have time to talk about them right now. But things like. Um, like uh, According to the Shafi'i Madhab, sperm uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is not, sorry, what did I mention? It's impure, no, sorry, I made a mistake there. Uh, sperm, money, according to the Shafi'i Madhab, it's not considered to be impure. It's pure, according to the Shafi'i school. And maybe one or two other Madhabs. But according to the Hanafis, it is. The Shafi'i say that, you know, a human being, you're all created. How can a human being be created? If a human being, if sperm is impure, then the whole human being is impure. A to Z, because we were created from it. Uh, but the Hanafis have their own evidence. It is a matter of which there is not a problem, you know, either way. So, but what everybody agrees upon is when sperm discharge, discharges and there's discharge of sperm, then you are required to have a ritual bath. Everybody agrees with that. You are required to have a ritual bath. Now learn the rules of the ritual bath. Um, in terms of, for example, I've mentioned in detail, successive sexual relations. You had one relationship, one session, you want to re-engage, do you have to take a bath or not? The khulas, I'll tell you in one, one minute, is that whether you want to re-engage in sexual relations, whether you want to go to sleep, uh, or whether you want to do some things like eat and drink or go downstairs or whatever, taking a bath is never necessary. It's only haram when you don't, yeah, okay, just, just finish this up. It's only haram when you... Um, you said you got time? Said, yeah, okay. It's only haram when, when, uh, uh, when you miss your salah. So, taking a bath is never necessary. Second level, at least, if you can't do that, do wudu, recommended. If you can't do that, then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, at least wash your private parts. And if, even if you cannot do that, then even then it's not sinful. You could just go to sleep if you want to. So these are some rules afterwards which, you know, of Tahara, purification, very important. And then there's a whole chapter on the etiquettes of the first night. Um, you can read them, I don't want to talk about them, it's just it's very simple. Um, but just one, can I just have one minute on one point of, uh, just, I feel very strong about this. Sheikh <laughs> just one point, yeah, if you don't mind. There's, there's five things here. Greeting with salam and dua, first night etiquettes, okay. Uh, the dua is mentioned, I'm not going to talk about that. Number two, offering prayers. There's light-hearted discussion, and then sexual relations. And point five on the first night of marriage, evil suspicions. I've actually talked about this in quite depth and strongly. Evil suspicions, especially this is related to men, because I'm addressing men, you know, so we... To have to, when you, when somebody gets married and on the first night, if they somehow find that their wife is not a virgin, and to have evil suspicions on this, it's absolutely categorically haram and sinful in Islam. You could be the most pious externally and you think you're pious, but Islamically you are committing a major sin of su'ud dhan. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu ishtanibu kathira min al-dhan inna ba'da dhanni ith wa la tajassasu wa la yaghtab. It's a major sin. I mean there's cases, I know a case where a woman got married and the husband was supposed to be, supposed to be so-called practicing, actually, well khair, I'll just say practicing. He divorced his wife the next day because he thought that, you know, she was not a virgin. 
First of all, how much guarantee is there that you're a virgin? Men, you know, how much guarantee is there? Seriously, just because it's hidden and nobody knows that how much haram you've committed in your past life. And then we just think, oh, women, they have to be pure. It cannot, be. even if they weren't virgin, if they, you know, repented from the sin, it's forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to have evil suspicion just on the fact that you don't see their virginity intact, it's a major sin. And do not call yourself a practicing brother or Muslim if you have these kind of suspicions. A Muslim does not have evil, baseless suspicions. So done. You know, the books of fiqh talk about 101 reasons because of which, you know, the hymen of a woman can be broken. And Islamically, any woman, remember this, and I'll end on this, Islamically, the definition of a virgin is any woman who has not been known within a community to have married before, and or who has not been known to have had unlawful Relationship, nobody knows. If even if she had a lawful relationship, even if she committed adultery, fornication, zina, but it was hidden, she's still Islamically considered a virgin. This is the definition of a virgin. All the rules of a virgin will apply. If she's known to have married, been married, or the whole world knew that she had a boyfriend and they, they, they had sex, then she's not a virgin. But otherwise, she's considered to be a virgin and we must consider them to be a virgin as well. So this is a very important point for brothers, inshallah, and with this, and I apologize, Shaykh Hassan Ali, for going over time.